in the previous lecture we discussed the concept of impedance transformation along a transmission line and uh, we established some so called golden rules pertaining to that impedance transformation and we also saw that because of the fact that in general in any transmission line there always exists two waves one going from the source to the load as expected and also a reflected wave or a backward wave that travels from the load to the source and because of that the voltage and current solutions on the transmission line essentially have two terms which are superimposing on each other so towards the end of the previous class we talked about a certain quantity called as standing wave ratio or to be precise what is called as the voltage standing wave ratio or the vswr the symbol was rho and we said that this rho is defined as the ratio of the voltage maxima magnitude to the voltage minima magnitude on the line we saw that the voltage on the line can be represented in a phasor or a vector format and we saw a diagrammatic or a graphical technique through which we we can find out what are the conditions when the voltage will be maximum what are the conditions when the voltage will be minimum so if you recall we had established that the voltage solution was something of this kind the magnitude of the voltage looks like this mod of v plus times mod of this quantity whole mod likewise the current magnitude can be represented in the following in, in this manner i am not going to show the whole step for you it is very straightforward once you know the current expression the only difference is that there is a z0 term and this plus is replaced by a minus so as far as the voltage is concerned we saw that this sum this vector sum can be represented in the following way a unit vector of magnitude 1 and another vector of magnitude mod of gamma l and the phase of this vector is this quantity phi l minus 2 beta l phi l is the phase component of the load reflection coefficient gamma l so we had established that since the resultant vector is essentially like this 1 plus this quantity for the voltage the voltage maxima or mod of vl max will lie over here and the minimum of the mod of v of l will lie at this point now you can very easily say just by looking at the expression for the current that because of this minus sign the point where we have the voltage minimum is the same point at which we are going to have the current maximum vice versa the point at which we have the voltage maxima magnitude we are going to have the current minima there as well so therefore if voltage is minimum current is maximum i can say that at the same point we are going to have the impedance minima as well 
and likewise we can say that at this point because of voltage maximum and, and current minimum we are going to have the impedance maxima over here so so that's that this was the easy part we also said that essentially when this vector tip moves clockwise it is moving away from the load and when the vector tip moves counterclockwise it is essentially movement towards the load because of the plus and minus l concepts now let us take a closer look in today's lecture So similar is the case in transmission line where you have two waves. Now in general the magnitude of the waves need not be equal to each other. Therefore we cannot always say that there will be a standing wave but there may be some phenomena which makes us remember the fundamental of a standing wave or a phenomena of a standing wave and under special conditions in a lossless transmission line standing waves do definitely happen so therefore let us see how As I had mentioned, unless mentioned otherwise, we will always assume that the line is lossless. Suppose I have this transmission line that is terminated with some load. Let's call it as ZL. Let's call it as ZL. So for, for the timing, let us just uh, for a moment go back to the convention of the x-axis and assume that moving right is the positive x-axis. So therefore I can rewrite the solutions for the voltage in this format. Now, to understand a standing wave pattern, it is not sufficient that we treat the voltage as a function of distance or position only. As we said that in general, you must always remember that voltage and current are time varying quantities and therefore in a transmission line, in any RF circuit, the voltage and current are functions of position as well as time. Two things. Although so far in our discussion we have been conveniently ignoring the time factor. Why? Because we know that the position and time are independent effects. So therefore if the time behavior of 
a voltage function is known, we can very easily incorporate that as a function of position also. So therefore, let us suppose there is a sinusoidal wave. There is a sine wave which is supposed to be travelling from the source to the load. So we can say that as a function of time, I can say that this sine wave has unit magnitude. So therefore, in the complex exponential form, we can denote this as a phasor. Where omega 0 is the angular frequency, let's say omega 0 is 2 pi f0. Where f0 is the actual frequency of this sinusoidal signal. So therefore, if I now try to express voltage as a function of position as well as time, that is nothing but V of x times whatever is the V of t, that is e raised to j omega 0 t. So substituting V of x, we get this V plus e raised to minus j beta x times e raised to j omega 0 t plus V minus e raised to plus j beta x times e raised to j omega 0 t. So therefore, we can say that this would become something of this kind, e raised to plus v minus e raised to this. So we have got some kind of this expression. Now let's suppose, let's suppose we take a very special case where let's assume that this load is an open circuit. What that means? That means ZL tends to infinity. So therefore, V of x comma t would become something like this. If I take the V plus common, This is what it is going to be. What is this quantity? This quantity is nothing but gamma L. That is the load reflection coefficient which is ZL minus Z0 divided by ZL plus Z0. So if ZL tends to infinity, gamma L will tend to plus 1. So therefore this quantity will essentially become 1. So rewriting what we get is this. Now what we can see using Euler's entity, this in general is going to be some cos function plus j times of some sine function. So therefore essentially these are phasors, they have real parts as well as imaginary parts. So therefore we can choose any one just to take a closer look at the time variation. So let us take a look at the real portion of V of x comma t. So, Let's assume that this is in general without the loss of generality. Let's assume that this quantity is real V plus. So let's say this is the one V plus times cos of omega 0 t minus beta x plus cos of omega 0 t plus beta x 
minus beta x and plus beta x. Two terms are there. So now using the standard trigonometric identities, we can say that this would reduce to this quantity. It will be twice v plus times cos omega 0 t times cos beta x. So effectively what we have now done is that this term omega 0 t minus beta x as well as omega 0 t plus beta x which were seemingly superposed on each other that is the space function as well as the time function they were kind of dependent on each other we have sort of segregated them by expressing them as two different product terms. So now let us not forget what omega 0 is that is 2 pi f0 where f0 is the frequency of the sine wave that is actually traveling as a function of time on the transmission line and let us say that this f0 is equal to 1 by t0 where of course t0 is the time period of the sine wave. So let us now try to see what this function of space and time or position and time looks like. So let us say this is my x axis. Let us call it as plus x. Remember for the time being we are just concerned about x rather than l but that is just something I am doing out, out for my convenience. You can prove very similar thing with L also, nothing stops you. So now let us see what this function would look like as a function of x but at different points of time. So let us take case 1. Case 1 is when t equals 0, right, when t equals 0. So when t equals 0, the argument omega t becomes 0, so cos of 0 is 1. So then v of x comma t becomes 2v plus times cos beta x. So therefore, let us see what it looks like. If this is 0, what I am going to do is that I am essentially going to plot this function. So what I need to do? I just have to plot this function 2v plus cos of b beta x and what would that look like? It would look something like this. The maxima will be at 0 the minima will be somewhere well it is not very difficult to find it out the minima will be when beta x equals pi by 2. So beta as we know is 2 pi by lambda. So therefore x will be lambda by 4. So this point is essentially lambda by 4. So let me just complete this. So again the maxima will be over here. So this point effectively is x equals lambda by 4 and this point would be not very difficult to guess it is lambda by 2 and notice that this is very much in consistence in consistency with our discussion from the previous lecture that is the maxima and the minima are separated by a distance of lambda by 4. This is because there are two waves which are superimposing on each other which have equal magnitude. Now let us see what happens for the second case and I am going to try and draw that with a different color. Let us say t equals 1 by 8 f0. So in that case what would happen? We would get 
cos omega 0 times this. So what, what would that be? That's cos of pi by 4. So I forgot to mention that the maximum amplitude will be 2b plus. So now what's going to happen? Cos of pi by 4 is what? 2b plus by root 2 times cos beta x. So therefore what's going to happen, there will be no change in the space phase, but it is just going to be another square, uh, another cosine wave or cosine function, but with reduced magnitude. So therefore it would look something like this. Let me very quickly label these. Let us now take another case where T one by four F zero. So in case of one by four F zero, this will be what? Cos of pi by two. And that will be zero. So therefore, when t equals one by four F zero, you're going to have a wave of zero magnitude. Because zero into cos beta x is still 0. So therefore, I can say this is when t equals 1 by 4 f0. Next, I am going to take another case. Let us say when t equals 1 by 2 f0. So what would that be? That would be simply 2b plus cos So it will be essentially cos of pi and cos of pi is minus 1 So therefore it will now be a cosine wave with magnitude 2b plus but out of phase so therefore, it would look something like this. The maxima would still be here. And this one we can label as T equals 1 by 2 f 0. Is that fine? Well, looks to me. So, so what can we conclude from this activity? We can conclude that at different functions or at different instances of time, the wave essentially would look like this. If I look only in this time window or in this portion of the transmission line, in this part of x from let us say minus lambda by 4 to plus lambda by 4, the wave would essentially look like this. 0, increasing, 0, increasing, 0, increasing. Interesting thing to notice is that the points at plus 
and minus lambda by 4 are always 0 no matter what. So therefore these points are called as nodes. These points are called as nodes and the points which can go up to the maxima they are called as antinodes. This point, this point, this point and so on. So what I can say looking at this point or this diagram is that the mod of V of X max that is the maximum voltage at the antinode. What is that? That is 2V plus. And V of X at the node that is 0. So therefore the maxima magnitude is 2V plus and the minima at the node is 0. So I can say by definition my VSW R row is 2V plus by 0 which tends to infinity. And is that correct? Well let's find out. In the last lecture we had defined that this VSW is nothing but 1 plus mod of gamma L divided by 1 minus mod of gamma L. What is gamma L for an open circuit? It is 1. So therefore if mod of gamma L is 1 rho will tend to infinity. So for open and short circuits mod gamma L is equal to 1. So that means your rho tends to infinity. This is the maximum value which rho can take. Now when is this happening? This is happening when mod gamma L is taking its maximum possible value because we know that the reflection coefficient magnitude can never exceed 1. So when gamma L is at the maximum, the VSWR is also at the maximum. So when will gamma L be minimum? Gamma L will be minimum when the load is a match load. For match load, we know that mod gamma L is 0. Match load means where the load impedance is equal to the line characteristic impedance. So in this scenario, if gamma L the mod gamma L is 0, then the rho will be equal to 1. So we can say that since the mod gamma L can vary between 0 and 1, correspondingly the rho varies from 1 to infinity. And what you notice is that as an engineer, as an RF engineer, people measure gamma L but many a time people measure rho also and it is seen that this measurement of rho is at times more preferred as compared to gamma L. Why? Because the range of gamma L is 0 to 1. So therefore if your measuring equipment is not good enough, if your measuring equipment is not good enough then there may be some error because you have a very small range from 0 to 1. But what you are observing here is that the range of VSWR can go from 1 to a very large number. So therefore even if the VSWR measuring equipment has some error, it will not cause a significant amount of damage in your measurement. So therefore often measurement of VSWR is more preferred as compared to measurement of mod gamma L. However in this day and age we have pretty good equipment which can measure gamma L also and essentially those equipment are called as reflectometers or network analyzers. But that's for another day. Now, now something that is interesting to note is that this calculation of rho as a function of gamma L. This is kind of you know 
in a way that is very interesting. Why? Because the minima of gamma L corresponds to the minima of rho also, whereas the maxima of gamma L corresponds to the maximum of rho also. So, why is that? That is because there is a mathematical name for this kind of function where we are mapping the values of gamma L onto rho. We are mapping the values of mod gamma L into rho. And what you see is that you are essentially dividing two quantities. In fact, they are two first order quantities, the first order in terms of gamma L mod. And this kind of a mapping from mod gamma L to rho is called as a bilinear mapping. There are two linear quantities. We cannot call them strictly linear, but since they are first order terms, it's okay to call them linear. So there are two first order or linear terms, so to speak. Therefore, this kind of mapping from mod gamma L to rho is called as a bilinear mapping. So, have we encountered a bilinear mapping in this course so far? Well, we have. We have indeed. Let us recall what is the expression for gamma L that is the reflection coefficient at the load that is z i'm sorry zl minus z0 divided by zl plus z0 if you recall in the previous lecture we had introduced a term called as normalized impedance so if i want to express the, the normalized load impedance that is small zl, that will be nothing but zl divided by z0. So if I divide both numerator and denominator by z0, what I will get is that gamma L equals small zl minus 1 divided by small zl plus 1. Right? Great. So, this is also another form of bilinear mapping where we are essentially mapping the normalized ZL values into the gamma L values. bilinear mapping from small zl to gamma l. So now, what is the nature of this small zl and gamma l? So in general, we know that zl can be complex because impedances can be real, they can be imaginary, they can be some combination of real and imaginary, thereby making it a complex value in general. So let us say this is something like small r plus small jx. What about gamma l? Well, we are dealing with lossless lines. So z0 is real. But since the zl can be complex, therefore gamma l is also complex. call this as some u plus jv. Let's call this as u plus jv. So if I were to show the possible values 
of ZL in the Cartesian plane, I could do this. Let's call this as ZL plane. Where the real axis is smaller and the imaginary axis is Jx. Now, which are the quadrants of interest? I will say that only the first quadrant and the fourth quadrant are of interest to us because the second and third cannot happen because resistance can never be negative. Is that correct? So this left portion of this Cartesian plane is not of any use to us. So we can therefore sort of compress this figure to make it look like this. That's fine. So, so this is what it is. This is the ZL plane of interest. Now, what would this look like? Or what would be the effect of the bilinear mapping onto this kind of z-plane? So, let us rewrite the bilinear mapping as we know it. Say gamma L equals zl minus 1 divided by ZL plus 1. So here we will draw the ZL plane and here we will draw the gamma L plane. So the ZL plane of interest to us is this as we drew it just a while back. And as we had defined gamma L is U plus JV. So therefore, we can draw this Cartesian plane here also and call this as U and this as JV. Simple as that. Now, let us see whether using this kind of bilinear mapping, we can map points on the ZL plane into points on the gamma L plane. Suppose ZL is 0. Suppose ZL is 0. So if ZL is 0, that means gamma L will be minus 1. So therefore I can say 0 would map to minus 1 on the gamma L plane. Is that fine? So let's very quickly draw a an arrow likewise if zl is infinity infinity on the positive axis or, or, or on the real axis resistive axis so if this is infinity what's going to happen although we cannot technically mark infinity on an any axis but for the sake of discussion if this is infinity real infinity then gamma l will be plus 1 so real infinity gets mapped to plus 1 this is what we know Next, next, suppose now Z is or this ZL is some real value. Let's say it is some value, some R and it has no imaginary component. That means it lies somewhere on this axis. So if ZL 
equals r and r is anything between 0 and infinity. What will gamma l be? What will gamma l be? Well, we can say in this case, if r is equal to 1, then gamma l will be 0. Because if r becomes equal to 1, zl becomes equal to 1, and then gamma l becomes 0. So therefore, if this is plus 1, then I can say that effectively this point is mapped to the origin on the gamma l plane. Yes. So, so now, this does not tell us for the entirety of this any value of r. So now if r is less than 1, if r is less than 1, then this quantity will be definitely negative but above minus 1 because in magnitude it will be below 1. So therefore, I can say that all the real values in this range will get mapped will get mapped to what? If r is less than 1 then definitely I can say gamma l will be something more than minus 1 but something less than 0. This is basic maths. So therefore this part of the axis will get mapped over here. Now let us consider the case where r is more than 1. If r is more than 1, definitely zl will also be more than 1 and therefore this quantity will now become positive but still in magnitude less than 1. So therefore this would be something more than 0 but less than plus 1. So therefore all the values from plus 1 to infinity, let's mark them this way. This would be mapped over here. Yes? Is that, is that fine? So, now let us Let us take one more step. Again, let me write it this way. Now let us assume that ZL is imaginary. That means it is equal to some JX. So therefore gamma L I can write as what? jx minus 1 divided by jx plus 1. So therefore, if I now again try to map it from the zl plane onto the gamma l plane. Now we are now totally talking about this imaginary axis jx. So gamma L plane looks like this, this is JB and this is U. So something which is purely imaginary, where would it be? 
So let us say, let us break this problem down into two halves. Let us say, consider if x is more than 0. That means it is an inductive impedance. If x is more than 0, then jx is a positive complex number. So it will lie somewhere over here. So let's mark that. So where would that lie? Well, if x is more than 0, what we are going to get is some jx minus 1 divided by jx plus 1 where x is more than 0. So therefore, what can I say about this complex number? I can say now that the magnitude of gamma L will always be 1. It can be plus 1, it can be minus 1, that I do not know. But the magnitude will always be plus 1. Correct? So that means if I want to accurately map a complex number from Z plane to the gamma plane, I need to know not just the magnitude but the phase also. So therefore, the phase of gamma L will be what? It will essentially be the tan inverse of minus x minus tan inverse of x. So, what does that tell you? What does that tell you? You can prove, essentially, you can prove in this case that the phi of L or phi phase of gamma L in this case I can write it as phi L also because that is the convention we have used. In this case you can prove that the phi L will be in the range of 0 to pi. That means in the upper half of this axis. So therefore if I want to trace out the locus of constant magnitude but phase from 0 to pi what it will be is this. It will be a semicircle which looks like this of radius 1. This is the point 1, this is also 1, and this is minus 1 or I should say this is j1. Let us do a sanity check. When x is 0, when x is 0, what is happening? Gamma L will become minus 1. So therefore, this corresponds to the point where x is 0. When x becomes plus infinity, gamma L will become 1. So therefore, we are correct in this sense. So therefore, let us place our lines like this that this axis now maps to the semicircle. Likewise, you can prove that the negative imaginary axis that is from this area would essentially map to the lower semicircle. So what we have here is that these are my inductive reactants and these are capacitive. So likewise, inductive loads get mapped over here, purely inductive loads on this upper semicircle 
and the capacitive loads get mapped to the lower semicircle. So this mapping, so to speak, this kind of bilinear mapping from the impedance plane onto the reflection coefficient or the gamma plane gives rise to something that is called as the Smith chart. And this mapping was initially done by a British engineer called Philip Smith. And this, what we are discussing, forms the foundation of the Smith chart. So a Smith chart, although it may look very forbidding and threatening to you, but it is a highly useful tool. And if you understand it really well, it will be your best friend as long as you are in touch with RF and microwave. So in today's class, in today's lecture, we revisited what is the standing wave pattern and uh, we essentially saw a case where the load is an open circuit and uh, effectively causes the wave to reflect back fully, thereby causing a standing wave which just oscillates this way and does not move anywhere thereby there is no flow of energy or power and thereafter we discussed this thing called as bilinear mapping from the impedance plane onto the complex gamma plane and this forms the basis of the Smith chart and we shall continue from this point on in the next lecture. Thank you.